Hi, we're going to have a look at the 2017 Leave Insert Higher Level Ratio question. As with all ratio questions, in part A we are asked to work out five different ratios. Part B we are asked to comment on the ratios, usually from the position of a bank, the venture holders or shareholders. And part C is usually theory or some other small little ratio comparison. So to start off with, we're going to have a look at part A, the five ratios we need to calculate. The first ratio asks us to work out the closing stock if the rate of stock turnover is 10 based on average stock. So we are looking for the closing stock. Now from the information that gives us about the stock turnover, we can work out total stock. We're given opening stock in the question. Opening stock in the question, we, I can see is 73,000. So that's going to be 73,000. And from the stock turnover information, I can work out total stock, and then the difference would just be my closing stock, because opening stock plus closing stock gives us total stock. So it tells us in the question that the stock turnover is 10. So the formula for stock turnover is cost of sales over average stock. And they tell us that's 10, so I let that equal 10. Now, all we do here is cross multiply, similar as we would do in maths. So 10 times my average stock should be equal to my cost of sales by, that's 10 over one, which is just over one, so be cost of sales by one. So 10 times average stock is equal to cost of sales by one, which is just cost of sales. Now I want to work out my average stock. So same as we do in maths to get average stock on its own, I divide by 10. If I divide by 10, that side of the equals, I also divide by 10, this side of the equals. These two tens cancel each other out. So I'm left at average stock, is equal to cost of sales divided by 10. Now, I know from the question, cost of sales or cost of goods sold from the P&L here is 565,000. And that's going to be divided by 10, which gives me an average stock of 56,500. So to work out my total stock, but my total stock is always just my average stock multiplied by two because the average stock is opening and closing. So to get my total, it will be just the average stock multiplied by two, which is 56,500 multiplied by two, which is 113,000. So I now know my total stock is 113,000. So to get my closing stock, it will be just 113 minus 73, which is 40,000. So closing stock is 40,000. Sometimes we might be asked to work out the opening stock, and if we are asked the opening stock, then we must be given the closing stock. Ratio number two, it asks us to calculate the dividend yield. Well, the formula for dividend yield is dividend per share over market price per share multiplied by 100. Now, the market price per share is easy to get because it's given to us at, underneath the balance sheet. The market price per share is 1 euro 35, or 135 cent. We're going to stay dealing in cent just so we don't uh, mix up the units we're working with. So it's 135 cent. Now the dividend per share, to work out the dividend per share, we actually have to do another ratio. So the dividend per share ratio is ordinary dividend over the number of ordinary shares. So now I need to split out my dividends and we'll have to do this every year because for some ratios I need ordinary dividend and some ratios I need preference dividend. Now in the question we are given total dividend. Okay, so in the question, if we go back here to my P&L, dividends paid here, I can see, is 50,000. So I know my dividends paid are 50,000. From the balance sheet, I can see that my preference shares, they are 5% preference shares, and there's 150,000 of them. So to work out the preference dividend, I just get 5% of 150,000. which is 7,500, and then the difference must be my ordinary dividend. So now I have my preference dividend and my ordinary dividend. So the dividend per share is ordinary dividend, which from above, I've worked out that my ordinary dividend is 42,500 over the number of ordinary shares, and the number of ordinary shares I will get from the bottom of my balance sheet, there's 450,000 ordinary shares. So to work that out, it comes to 0 0.0944 euro. And again, as I said earlier, I'm dealing in cents, so to change that to cent, I'm just going to multiply it by 100, which is 9.44 cent. So now I know my dividend per share is 9.44, so 
So my dividend per share over my market price per share multiplied by 100 will give me my dividend yield, which works out to be 6.99%. And with all these ratios, we're asked to round them off to two decimal places. That's why I leave it at 6.99%. The next ratio I'm asked to work out is the earnings per share. Now the race, the formula for earnings per share is net profit, less interest, less preference dividend over the number of ordinary shares. So if I go back to my P&L, I can see from my P&L that the net profit of 114,000 is less interest already. So I don't need to take that away again or else I'll be double counted. So the net profit less interest is 114,000. So now I just have to take away my preference dividend, which I worked out above here at the top, and the preference dividend worked out to be 7,500. I'm going to divide that by the number of ordinary shares, which we said earlier, the number of ordinary shares at the bottom of the balance sheet were 450,000. So that works out to be 114 minus 7,500 divided by 450,000 is 0.2367 euro. And again, to get my answer in cent, I'm just going to multiply it by 100, which gives me 23.67 cent to two decimal places. The next ratio I'm asked to work out is return on equity funds. So the return on equity fund is net profit, less interest, less preference dividend, same as the previous ratio, over ordinary shareholders' equity. So the top line is going to be the same as the previous ratio because the net profit less the interest already is 114,000. So again, I just need to take away my preference dividend of 7,500. This time, it's over the ordinary shareholders' equity. So if we get on to the bottom of the balance sheet, there's four figures that make up the capital employed here. Two are seen as debt and two are seen as equity. The debentures are seen as debt because they're a loan that has to be repaid in 2019. The preference shares are also seen as debt because they're treated like uh, a loan from the shareholders to have different rights than ordinary shareholders. So the two equity figures we're going to take are the 450,000 ordinary shares and the 79,000 profit and loss balance. So the ordinary shareholders equity is going to be 450,000 ordinary shares plus the 79,000 the profit and loss balance, which comes to 529,000. So to work out the return, and again, we're going to be multiplying it by 100 because it's going to be a percentage. So it's going to be 114,000 minus 7,500 divided by 529,000 multiplied by 100, which works out to be 20.13% to two decimal places. And the last ratio we're asked to work out is interest cover. And the formula for interest cover is profit before interest over interest. So if I go back to my P&L again, I can see that this profit of 114,000 is after the interest has been taken away. So the profit before the interest would be 114,000 plus 16,000. And that is over the interest of 16,000. So this is going to be 114 plus 16 divided by 16, which works out to be 8.13 times. So that is the interest cover calculator. So that's part A of the question done. We've worked out all the five ratios we were asked to work out. Part B of the question says, advise the bank manager. So this, this year we're looking from the point of view of a bank manager. If a loan of 300,000, in which a rate of 6% will be charged, should be granted to JV PLC. The loan is to finance the modernization of the manufacturing plant. Use relevant ratios, percentages, and other information to support your answer. So when I am doing part B of these questions, I will try and keep it as standard a format as possible. 
So I'll usually have six definite headings. The first five will always be the same and the last one will be different depending on whether you're talking about the point of view of shareholders, your sixth heading would be share price. And if you're talking from the point of view of the bench or holders or banks, your sixth heading will be security. So the first five will be the same and the sixth one will be different. And then we will do a conclusion. So if we get on through these, and again, I'd always try and do them in the same order just to try and standardize your answer so you have less chance of making a mistake. So the first heading I'd always look at is profitability. And for profitability, the main ratio you need to calculate is return on capital employed. And the return on capital employed is net profit before interest over capital employed multiplied by 100. And over here, these are the kind of questions that I'd ask myself to help me write an answer for the probability section. They can be useful when you're answering probability. So the first thing to work out my return on capital employed, it's my profit before interest. Well, as we said already with the interest cover, the profit before interest, 114,000 is after interest is taken away. So the profit before interest will be 114 plus the 16,000. So it'll be 114,000 plus 16,000. Over the capital employed, and the capital employed is the total of my balance sheet. So the capital employed will be my 800 and 79,000 here, the total of my balance sheet. And I'm going to multiply that by 100, because my answer is a percentage. So this is going to be equal to 114 plus 16,000 divided by 879,000 multiply by 100. So my return on capital employed works out to be 14.79%. So to do this answer, the three main things we compare it to, we compare it to the previous year, we compare it to the rate from risk-free investments, such as banks, building societies, and credit unions, and we also compare it to the percentage uh, of the ventures, the percentage rate that we have to pay interest on the ventures. And again, you can look at these yourselves how, how this will help you to answer profitability. So first of all, anyway, the company is profitable. They're making 14.79%, uh, which is good. To say in or around 10%, anything over that is seen as good, even though there's no definite uh, percentage, because some people might be happy with 10 or more, and some people might be happy with less, but in or around 10% to say is good. So the company is profitable. I'm going to compare it to last year. If I look at my last year's figures here, the return on capital employed is 12%. So this year is 14.79. So the return on capital employed has improved from 12% in 2015 to 14.79 in 2016, which is a positive trend. It's good. They like when you talk about the trends. The company has made efficient use of resources than the previous year. So the company has made more efficient use of resources than the previous year. So if it's gone up, we say the company has made more efficient use of resources. If it had gone down, we would say the company has made less efficient use of resources. And again, that's a standard sentence you can always put in. The return of 14.79% is well above the return from risk-free investments of 2 to 3%. So if you invested your money in a bank, billing, society, or credit union, you would get an interest of maybe 2 to 3%, depending on which institution you use. And again, they'll all have different rates. If you uh, put your money into a company, you'd expect a greater return because there's a risk in a company. There's no risk if you put it into a bank, building, society, or a credit union. So we're earning 14.79%, which is well above what you get if you put it into a bank, a building, society, or credit union of 2 to 3%, which is good. It's also above the company's cost of borrowing of 8%. So to the ventures they have, they're paying 8%. They're earning a return of 14.79%, so it's, it's worth borrowing that money. It's also above the 6% interest being charged on the proposed loan. So in here, in the question, it says the interest of paying the loan is 6%. Well, if they're getting money at 6% and they're earning a return of 14.79%, again, it would be worth doing. And the company should have no problem paying back the interest to the bank because they're a profitable company. If they get the loan of 300,000, they shouldn't have any problem paying back the interest to the bank. And that should be enough to cover profitability to first heading. The second heading we're going to look at always is liquidity. And for liquidity, the main ratio we need to work out is the asset test or the quick ratio. Some people might also do the current ratio, but the asset test ratio is the most important one. 
So to work out the asset test ratio, we're going to get our current assets, which we'll get from the balance sheet. So my current assets from the balance sheet are 130,000. I'm going to take away my closing stock, which I actually worked out in the ratios here. The first ratio is 40,000. So I'm going to take away my closing stock. And I'm going to compare that to my current liabilities. So my current liabilities in the balance sheet, liabilities less than one year are 81,000. And the reason you take away closing stock for the asset test ratio is, depending on what type of company it is, that closing stock may not be easily converted into cash. So that's why we take away the closing stock. So 130,000 minus 40,000 is 90,000. And we're comparing that to 81,000. So that gives me an asset test ratio of 1.11 is to one. So anything over one is to one is seen as good, and anything less than one is to one is bad. Liquidity is probably one of the most important ratios, and if it's less than one is to one, even if the company is profitable and so on, if they don't have any cash in the short term, they won't be able to operate. So if the liquidity is bad, in general, the company will be going bad. But this company, the liquidity is above one is to one, which is good. Last year, if we look at last year's figures, the Quick ratio or asset test ratio is 0 0.8 is to 1, which is bad. So it has improved on the previous year. So the asset test ratio has improved from 0 0.8 to 1 in 2015 to 1.11 1 .1 is to 1 in 2016. The company does not have a liquidity problem. <clears throat> if it was less than 1 is to 1, we would say the company had a liquidity problem. The company has 1 euro 11 available in liquid assets for every 1 euro owed in the short term. Again, that's a standard sentence we'd always put in. If that was 0 0.75 is to 1, we'd say the company had 75 cents available in liquid assets. But this company has 1 euro and 11 available in liquid assets for every 1 euro owed in the short term. We're comparing the current assets to current liabilities. The company should have no problem paying short term debts as the fall due. If it was less than 1 to 1, we'd say the company would have a problem paying short term debts as the fall due. And if the loan is granted, the company should be able to pay the interest of 18,000. Again, the loan they were getting, the bank loan was 300,000 rate of interest, 6%, which, which would have um, gave us interest of 18,000. So they shouldn't have any problem paying back that interest of 18,000. The third heading we're going to look at is gearing. Now, usually we just have to work out the gearing um, from the question, but here they're suggesting a further loan of 300,000, which will change the gearing. So we're going to have to work out the gearing twice, before the loan and after the loan. So the gearing ratio, the gearing is how much debt there is in the company. So the gearing ratio, is the debentures and the preference shares, as we spoke about earlier, of the four bottom figures in the balance sheet. These two are seen as the debt, the debentures and the preference shares. And we're going to put them over the capital employee, the total of the balance sheet. So if we go back to the question, I can see from the bottom of the balance sheet, my debentures are 200,000 and my preference shares are 150,000. So 200,000 plus 150,000 over the total of the balance sheet, which is 879,000. My capital employed is 879,000. And again, I'm multiplying that by 100 because my answer is in percentage. So before the loan, it would be 200,000 plus 150,000 divided by 879,000 and multiply by 100. So before the loan, the gearing would be 39.82%. Now, after the gearing, the debentures and the loan, I'm gonna put the loan in along with the debentures. So if I got my debentures and my loan, so it would be 200,000 plus the extra loan of 300,000 so I'd have loans or the benches of 500,000. My preference shares would be still 150,000. And my capital employed would go from 879. I'd have to add 300 to that if the loan was granted, which would leave you with a capital employed of 1179000. And again, I'd work multiply that by 100 to get as a percentage. So if the loan of 300,000 was granted, my capital employed, sorry, my gearing, 
would be Fifty five point one three per cent. Okay, so we go from lowly geared to highly geared because anything under fifty per cent is lowly geared, anything over fifty per cent is highly geared, and if it's fifty per cent, it is neutrally geared. Now the second ratio we look at under the heading of gearing is interest cover, and we have this done already in part A, but we'll do it again quickly. It's just profit before interest over interest. So the profit we said it was 114,000, which is after the interest of 16,000. So the profit before interest will be 114,000 plus 16,000 over 16,000. And the exam, you to be no need to do it again, but we'll just do it here quickly. So it'll be 114 plus 16 divided by 16. So it's 8.13 times. And again, if you want to read these, you can press pause and read through um, these boxes here. They'll help you answer each of the headings. So here we're going to say the company is lowly geared. So currently it's 39.82%, which is less than 50%. So the company currently is lowly geared. The gearing position has improved. Now, if we go back to last year, we'll see that the gearing was 45%. So the gearing has gone down, which is good. It's improved. So the gearing has improved from 45% in 2015 to 39.82% this year in 2016. The company is less at risk from outside investors. If the gearing went up, we would say the company was more at risk from outside investors. Now, if the 300,000 loan is granted, the gearing will worsen to 55.13%. We can see that here, becoming highly geared and more at risk from outside investors. So if they do grant a loan of 300,000, they will go from lowly geared to highly geared. The business will be financed on a long-term basis more by debt than by equity. So the total of the balance sheet will be made up more by debt than by equity if the 300,000 loan is granted. The interest cover, if we look at interest cover last year, we can see that the interest cover is six times. This year, the interest cover is 8.13 times. So the interest cover has improved from six times in 2015 to 8.13 times in 2016. So the higher the interest cover, the better. The more profit we have, the interest we have to pay. So the company should have no problem paying back interest if the new loan is granted. Because currently, the interest cover is very high at over eight times. Fourth heading we're going to have a look at is dividend policy, and this is one that people can find difficult. So whenever I'm doing dividend policy, I will always throw out this little table first, and when you use the table, then out, it makes it very easy to answer the question. So for this table, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my earnings per share, my dividend per share, and then my payout, how much of my earnings I'm paying as dividend, what percentage of your earnings I'm paying as as a dividend. Then I'm going to work out my dividend cover for both years. I'm going to work out my dividend yield for both years. And then it should be easy to compare those figures. So the, the earnings per share is the first thing. Now we're given these uh, here in the box for last year. The earnings per share is 18 cent and the dividend per share is 8 cent. So the earnings per share is 18, the dividend per share is 8. So the payout, how much of the earnings to pay in this dividend, I'm just going to calculate by getting 8 divided by 18 and multiply by 100. So they're paying out 44.44% of their earnings and dividends. My dividend cover is just calculated by working out the earnings per share divided by the dividend per share, which is 2.25 times. And sometimes you're giving that, sometimes you're not. We are giving it here, but some years we're not giving it, so we need to work it out. And the dividend yield is the dividend per share, which is eight divided by the market price per share. So now I need to, I just fill in my market price per share first, because the first four ratios, I'm just using my earnings per share and dividend per share, but now I'm gonna to have to use my market price per share. So I just fill these in. The market price per share last year was one euro 20 or 120 cent, and this year it's one euro 35 or 135 cent. So 120 and 135. So the dividend yield, is just the dividend per share divided by the market price per share multiplied by 100, which is 6.67%. So that is all of the figures, those five figures worked out for 2015. 
Now we have to do the same for the 2016, and initially it might look like this is a lot of work, but if we go back to the ratios, we usually have worked out the earnings per share and the dividend per share already here. So I can see here from the dividend yield, I've worked out the dividend per share to be 9.44. So I fill that in, 9.44. And again, if I go back to my ratios, here I can see the earning per ordinary share, the earnings per share I worked out to be 23.67%. So that's 23.67. So usually you won't have to work these out again, which will save a lot of time. So to work out my payout for 2016, it's going to be equal to 9.44 divided by 23.67, and I'm going to multiply that by 100. So the payout is 39.88%. Again, the dividend to work out the dividend cover, I'm going to get my earnings per share and divide it by dividend per share, which is 2.51. And to work out my dividend yield, it's going to be equal to dividend per share divided by the market price per share and multiplied by 100, which is 6.99%. So now that we have those worked out, it should make it a lot easier to comment on the dividend policy of the company. Usually what they say is that around 50% payout is good. Keep half of the money in the company and pay half out to shareholders through dividends. So from the point of view of the bank, if it was less from the bank, less than 50%, they wouldn't be overly worried. Um, but if it was less than 50%, shareholders probably would be worried. They'd want at least a 50% return. But here the bank will be happy enough because they're not, they don't have an excessive dividend policy. They're not paying out too much dividends to shareholders. So both the earnings per share and dividend per share has improved from last year. They've both gone up from last year. In 2015, the company paid out 44.44%, and in 2016, 39.88, or 0.91, I have here, 88, just a small rounding difference, of their profits and dividends. The bank will be happy as they are not paying out excessive dividends and are keeping some of the profits in the company to pay the loan interest. The dividend cover here, we can see, has improved from 2.25 times in 2015 to 2.15 times in 2016. And the dividend yield has improved from 6.67% to 6.99 or 7% in 2016. And is great. this is greater than the return, again, you would get from risk-free investments of 2 to 3%. So overall, the bank would be happy with the dividend policy of the company. And again, you can see here some of the stuff that will guide you through how to answer the dividend part of it. Now, dividends is probably slightly more relevant for shareholders, but it's also important for banks because they want to make sure that the company aren't paying out too much of the earnings in dividends. Heading number five is sector. And for sector, there's no ratios. You just need to comment on the sector that the company is in. So usually you'd speak about it, what the prospects are like in the short term and the long term. So JB PLC is a health food manufacturer and we can see that from the very top of the question here. It says they are a health food manufacturer. This is currently a growing industry. So health food and health in general are becoming more popular. People are becoming more health conscious and are more careful about what they eat. In the short term, prospects are good as the population starts to age and many people will take supplements as part of their diet. However, in the long term, health foods tend to be fatty by nature and go out of fashion very quickly. So it might be very popular now, but it can go out of fashion. The sector will be under pressure from competition from abroad. And this is a kind of standard sentence we can say about all sectors, well, the majority of them anyway. So that's probably enough to, to talk about for the sector. We don't need a massive in-depth knowledge of the sector, but we need to just make a few relevant points to get the marks. And again, if you, for 
if you were talking about now you could talk about stuff like Brexit and the upturn of the economy and even how the coronavirus and so on would be bad for the economy and that's for all uh, very much up-to-date stuff that we could put in now for our 2020 exam. The last heading, so the first five headings will always be the same. Now the last heading, if we're asked from the point of view of shareholders and B, my last heading will be share price and I will do a video again from the point of view of shareholders but here we're asked about a bank loan of 300,000 so because we're talking from the point of view of the venture holders or bank my sixth heading is going to be security. So for security we just want to make sure that we have enough fixed assets to cover the loan. So the first thing I'm going to do I is fill in the value of my assets. So from the question I can see my intangible assets are 150,000. My tangible assets are 580, so 150,000, 580,000, and my financial assets or my investments were 100,000. So my total fixed assets from my balance sheet, I can see, come to 830,000. Now, what loans do I have? Do the ventures I have already, or the ventures or my long-term loans already, are 200,000? And the additional loan for 300,000 that I'm looking for will give me total loans for 500,000. Now, I, from, from the point of view of security, we want to see that if the company defaults on these payments that they have enough fixed assets to cover the loan. So the total value of fixed assets is 830,000. So all my fixed assets, the total fixed assets come to 830,000. The new loan will be secured on the tangible fixed assets of the company. So this new loan of 300,000 will be secured on the tangible fixed assets to 580,000. And there is, appears to be more than enough tangible fixed assets to cover the loan. So taking into account the 200 already committed to securing uh, the existing debentures, there will be 380 um, remaining to cover the new loan, which is adequate. Okay, so if there's 200,000 debentures already secured into 580, that would leave 380,000 left over, which is more than enough to cover 300,000 loan. This is a standard sentence we always put in because there's no talk of what the depreciation policy of the company is. So we would always, the bank would question what the depreciation policy of the company is. So we would always question what the depreciation policy of the company is because we aren't told. The investments, and again, we're just going to put in a, one sentence maybe on our financial assets or investments and one sentence on our intangible assets. So from the balance sheet, I can see that the investments cost 100,000 and are now have a market value of 120,000, which is good. So the 100,000 investments have a market value of 120,000, indicating a good investment policy by the company. If they were less, if the market value was less than what we paid for them, we'd say it was a bad investment policy of the company. And the bank would also question the true value of intangible fixed assets, because here we're just told we have intangible fixed assets of 150,000. We're not told what they are, whether they're patents or goodwill. We're not told how many uh, years they're written off over and so on. So we just have to question that that is the actual value of them, the 150,000. So that is the sixth heading done. Now, because we are asked about the loan of 300,000, we're going to put in just a little paragraph about the purpose of the loan. Why did we want the loan? So the loan is required for the modernization of the manufacturing facility. This is specific and for a productive purpose and will help reduce uh, the cost of production. The extra production will generate more income to repay and service the loan. So if they get this loan and can improve the manufacturing facility, they should be able to make more profits, which will mean they should be able to pay back the loan. And can, a small conclusion at the end is nice just to tie up the whole question. So we could say here, due to the fact the company has good profitability, so the profitability has gone up, it has no liquidity issues, the asset debt ratio is over one is to one, it has a sensible dividend policy, they're not paying out too much of their earnings or dividends, and they have enough tangible fixed assets to secure the loan, I would advise that the bank grant the loan of 300,000. So again, our first five headings will be the same. The sixth heading will be either, when we're talking about from the point of view of the venture holders or banks, our sixth heading will be security. And if we're talking from the point of view of shareholders, our sixth heading will be share price. And we'll have a look at that again in another video. And again, there is no harm just to do up a small conclusion at the end. So the more standardized you get used to answering these questions and ratios, the better. So that is part B done and part C here, 
is a small bit of theory. So it says employees are users of financial information. If you were an employee of JB PLC, explain why the financial information of the company would be of interest to you. So to look at that, if you were an employee, it would be uh, of interest to you. So, so you could assess your job security. If the company is going good, your job should be okay. If the company is losing a lot of money, you might be worried about your job security. To see if sh uh, shareholder dividends are increasing, which could be used as a negotiation strategy. To see if the company can continue to pay existing wage rates or can afford a pay rise. So if the company is going really well, you might get a pay rise. To see if the company plans to expand and thereby assess the prospects for a promotion and to assess pension security. So all of those would be relevant if you were an employee. And the last part of the question says, identify two other users of financial statements. So two other users of financial statements would be lending institutions. So banks would be interested in the financial statement of the company. Trade creditors uh, would be interested to see if you have the money to pay them back. Shareholders would be interested in the accounts. The revenue competitors would be interested to see your financial position and also directors of the company. So there are lots of other um, users of the financial information. So I hope that helps you answer the interpretation of accounts or ratios question. I'll have a look again at another question from the point of view of shareholders soon. And if you thought that was useful, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you.